No, it's not the man from Snowy River, and it's nowhere near the Never Never. I have seen a black wombat throw the boomerang. The whip-cracking horseman is Colin Dangard, and the location, trendy Malibu in Southern California. Certainly, when Dangard first started importing Aussie saddles for his buddies in California, most Americans preferred bandy legs to the wimpy-looking piece of leather that straddled those scrawny Australian stock horses. They thought that uh, I was crazy, that who was I promoting this rinky-dink little saddle, which they thought was good for ladies and uh, their big tough cowboys would never ride it. Uh, uh, and uh, so I got thrown out of uh, rodeos all over the place, you know. This shipment, amended to suit American horse breeds, will end up between the legs of the mounted police force in Dallas, Texas. This is a nice little light saddle. <clears throat> Officers like it. Uh, they can't get pulled out of it. Uh, somebody throws a bottle at them and <laughs> the horse does a pirouette and a rondé jambe, you know, and they're still in the saddle and that's what they're going for. Cop this. <laughs> if he thought he had a knife, check this out. People say, what do you do with that? Shave. <laughs> G'day, I'm Colin Dangard, president of the Australian Stock Saddle Company. For the past 10 years, you've heard me talking about Australian saddles, but this is my first video. Basically today what we're going to do is answer the question, why should you own an Australian stock saddle? I've got a lot of answers and no doubt you've got a lot of questions. We're going to explore the comfort of the saddle for you and your horse, how to fit it on your horse, all the gear you can hang off an Australian saddle, how you ride it, and basically why you should own one. Let's have a look at this. This is your basic Australian stock saddle. In this particular case, a Somerset by Trevor James, our most popular model, by the way, and uh, the biggest selling Australian made saddle in the US, at least made out of leather. Uh, as you can see, the big difference right off between this and other saddles is a knee pad. The reason of that knee pad is to simply keep you in the seat. When you're riding along, you shouldn't feel it, but when you're riding along and your horse props, shies and spins to the left or the right, instead of flying over the top of the horse and out the shoulder where 95% of people go in that situation, this will keep you there. This surf single stops the saddle from rolling. We're going to talk more about this girthing system later, and that's why this little dandy is right there. Australia is a pretty hard country, and especially the ground. This is why this was developed. When uh, convicts first went to Australia, the lucky ones escaped with a horse and hopefully it had a saddle on it. So off they charged into the bush and uh, these two guys couldn't ride very well so they flew off their English saddles. But they did find if they sewed leather to this to the front, they stayed in. And then the troopers couldn't catch them because they were riding English saddles. <laughs> Would have taken an act of parliament for them to put, to change their regulation saddle. So that's the whole reason why this started. It's called a poly as you've heard, pretty strange name. But poly means if you, if you cut the horns off a cow, uh, what do you have? A poly cow. So when people first saw this, the ears resembled the ears of a cow. So they call poly. So any saddle with this on it is called a poly. So let's talk about how you sit in the saddle, how you ride it, where it should be. You'll notice right here now, you'll see that the knee pad is curved on the Somerset. You have a s angle at the base of the bottom of the knee pad right there to when you're going down hills you can get your thigh under that and really thunder down get your legs forward and your heels down feel the balance of the horse now when you're going on the up the other side of the hill you get up out of the saddle lean forward grab a hunk of mane that's a very good idea and you'll notice now your thigh is going to come around the upside of it Therefore, you can maintain your balance, freeing up the bottom of the horse to propel you. The Australian saddle is extremely well balanced. If you took away this knee pad and that cantle, you would have through here what is basically a dressage saddle. When you're riding along in an Australian saddle at the walk, your heels are down, your feet are slightly forward, and your back is arched and straight. The faster you go in an Australian saddle, the more forward you get. Posting is no problem at all if, A, the saddle fits you correctly, and B, if you can post correctly. Posting in an Australian saddle is a very small deal. It's just clearing the seat, but we're going to discuss all that riding technique later. 
Perhaps the best way to uh, really describe an Australian saddle is to compare it with the two most common saddles in America today, and a Western saddle and an English saddle. Let's take a look at an English saddle here. Well, here's your basic English saddle, in this case an all-purpose. You can see that through here, it's very similar to the Australian saddle. If you add a knee pad, if you build up the back, you actually have an Australian stock saddle. But obviously, this is just an all-purpose English saddle. So you can see the action here. The whole idea of this saddle it was invented for sport by the English gentry centuries ago when they were thundering around the back palace there, back in the back 40 with champagne in hand and ladies in waiting. Well, the idea was to see who could stay in their, in their flat seats and uh, those who could were considered superb horsemen. And indeed they were. To stay in an English saddle in very difficult uh, situations, jumps, breaches, creeks, all of that, you have to be a superb rider. The Australians said, well, let's forget the sport. Let's just stay alive. We want to ride hard, but we want to get home and dance and have dinner at the end of the day and a couple of stubbies and a few beers. So you can see here, that if you were galloping along in this saddle and the horse props and shies and does a spin, you just keep going about there, about in that direction. We call this the self-unloader in Australia. Fine saddle, but it's the self-unloader. And for particular, for particular kinds of riding. Now let's compare it with a Western saddle. Now here you have a fairly typical Western saddle. In this case, of course, it's a cutting saddle. Anybody can see that. But the idea of the Western saddle developed out of working cattle with a rope. That was something that the Castilian Spanish started and then as America became settled, it became a way for them to work their cattle. So the saddles got bigger, longer, heavier. So they could sustain the weight of a beast pulling on this horn. The Western roping saddle is the finest roping saddle in the world. In fact, it's the only real roping saddle in the world. But you can see with this saddle that it doesn't have a knee pad like this. It has a swell like this. And you can, of course, you can buy squaw tits and put them here and that's an appendage and uh, that'll help a little bit too. The closer you get to an Australian saddle, the more security you're going to get actually. So, but still if you're flying along now in this saddle and your horse prop spins to the side uh, you've, and your body starts moving forward and out this way with the inertia, the way to, a good way to stop yourself falling is to immediately grab that horn as the horse is turning. Well, should you miss that, you're going over there. This saddle is built for, in this particular case, cutting, but if the horn was of a different uh, shape, like a roping horn, that would be built for roping. If I was going to cut, I'd use this saddle. If I was going to rope, I'd use a roping saddle. If I was going to jump five foot rails, I would use a jumping saddle. But if I was going to ride on trails up and down hills, having a very fine time, thank you, give me an Australian stock saddle because I'll be home at the end of the day. <laughs> You know, 10 years ago when I started selling Australian stock saddles in the US, I got thrown out of most of the rodeos and shows there was. As far as the officials were concerned, uh, the shows had more exits than the Astrodome. Uh, today, of course, the saddle is enormously popular, especially with trail riders and police departments and uh, just people who want to want the security, want the comfort. And famous people are riding the saddle too. Let's go up to Bo Derrick's place. She lives in Santa Inez. Bo's a fabulous lady. She also has fabulous Andalusians and a whole bunch of Australian stock saddles. That's another one of Colin Dangard's marketing skills. Getting to the right people, like film star Bo Derrick. I like this saddle. Yeah. I like this even better than my other one. This is uh, from Trevor James. Uh -huh. You see it's a very racy saddle. Uh -huh. It's a Great. really high performance saddle. Great. Made it special for you. I'm ready. That's good. Go. Let's put it on and get it dirty before anybody <laughs> changes their mind. He once worked as a Hollywood showbiz journalist. Contacts made then are still friends. And some of them like horses and his saddles. Oh, that's worthy of you. Isn't that a good fit? Yeah, I think it looks good with the horn. It does. It does. That looks great on you. Americans have been riding less and less because their saddles are so big, women can't lift them. 75% of the riders in America are women. And then along I come with this little light saddle. They get in that, they can lift it, they can cinch it up, and uh, they just love it. Make a difference. Yeah, you like it. This feels good. I like this. Oh, it's so soft. Apart from Bo, other celebrities, including Ronald Reagan, Susan George, and Robert Wagner, are riding comfortably in Australian stock saddles. And all these little improvements. Great. It's got a horn. It's a bit flat. <laughs> oh, it's flat. This is nice. <laughs> That's 
Colin Dangard has made the American fad for things Australian work for him, and he can see no end to it. Thank you, Bo, and what a fabulous lady Bo is. Great horsewoman, too. Well, people always ask, what are all these Ds for on the Australian stock saddle? This saddle has more Ds than didgeridoo. First of all, let's start with the bracket in the front. That's the breastplate bracket for a breastplate. And here's our breastplate here, which as you see is simply a hunt style breastplate. This is the connector strap that goes through the breastplate bracket like that and attaches and buckles here. You have plenty of adjustment on this little connector strap there. And of course the other one goes to this side here. Now, the, on the bottom of the girth you have, the bottom of the breastplate you have a snap. This snap goes to a ring which is on the underside of the girth and at the center. That just snaps onto there. Or you can bring both rings together if you like, but one's good enough. Also attached here is a snap-on martingale through which you can put the reins. Well, there we go. That solves a couple of brackets. Now we have the crouper or the crupper. I never know whether it's a crouper or a crupper, but anyhow, it's a nice handy-dandy piece of equipment. This strap here at the end goes through a loop that's at the back of the saddle. It simply slides through like that hooks on there, comes through here through the loop and then you adjust it through the buckle there. You have plenty of adjustment. Mules actually have longer extensions for which, which we sell and that of course stops your saddle from slipping over the horse's neck or the mule's neck as you're charging down the hill of 45 degrees, which of course we all do. Now this is the part that goes around the horse's tail and you see you have a little uh, D here which you unbuckle, strap this around the horse's tail. Good idea to grease this before you do that if your horse hasn't had a crouper before. And uh, indeed to attach, attach this to a uh, strap which goes around the horse's neck and lunge the horse for uh, five minutes until you make sure he perfectly accepts this. Then you put it on the saddle, then you put it on the horse. Saves wrecking your saddle. Now, you have the little brackets in front of the saddle they're utilitary straps where you can just uh, tie anything. You can hang down a couple of ladder goes. You can put your uh, rope there or you can put your halter there or whatever. Now behind the knee pad there's a couple of little fall down Ds here we call them. People always say, what are those? Very good question. What they are for is a back tie point for your bedroll. In Australia we carry our rolls in front of the saddle more often than behind. And this gives you a back tie point to stop it flapping around. In Australia, the more stuff you can have in front of you in the bush at the gallop, the better. More protection. Now at the back, you see you have three Ds. This here is for the saddlebags, which come in three sizes. Here's the medium bags, and you'll notice that one side is higher than the other. You put the high side to the back, and you put them, connect them to the first two Ds. You have a near side bag and an off side bag. And there you are, the medium bags. They carry about a six-pack. Now, if you want to carry a couple of six-packs, of course, we have the luxury bags right here. Once again, you have a high side and a low side. There's your high side. Put those there and put this one here. And, of course, you balance saddle bags. You don't put a couple of house bricks in this side and a, and a bit of frou-frou on -frou this side. You balance it like a boat. Well, there's the luxury bags. Now we have... Oh, this is a beauty here. Hey, cop this. This is the wither bag, first used by the Australian cavalry and ripped off by myself out of their military catalogue. So you put this across the withers of the horse. This little strap here goes back to the girth. Now, you can put a couple of house bricks in this if you like, but what it's really good for is ice and cold drinks, and you can get a neoprene insert and put in there and uh, you, put, you can load up the other side, and this can take enormous weight because it's right over the horse's front legs. And this strap goes around the chest. And then you see you have two rings on top here. 
you can tie even more cargo to the top and strap it across there. Great. These wither bags are just fabulous. I like them. And we have another version of them which carries canvas bags for water. Very good for long distance. Well, there's the wither bags. Now, the halter bridle. I love halter bridles. You see, you see this here? This is the brow band, and here you have the pole band, and you've got this connector strap at the back, and you connect the bit onto here. So you've been riding all morning, and now you're going to release the horse. You can unbuckle the bit there, throw away the reins, attach your lead line to this, tie it to a tree. And then while, while you're having your sandwiches, your horse uh, doesn't rub his bridle off, and uh, you don't have to chase him for five miles. That's the hold of bridle. Now, we also have a set of reins, which of course attaches to the bit. Australians tend to carry their reins uh, unattached, open-handed. Uh, but you can have a buckle, you can tie them together, do what you want, I don't care. Here we go. Now, let's talk about the, the uh, various options for, uh, for the stirrup here. This is the fender, which is great. Fenders are marvelous. You can ride in these with shorts, which I do. Malibu, it gets very hot. Or you can have a two-inch leather. Or you could have an English leather. It doesn't matter. Either way, they hook onto this little bracket under here. Just slides on. We can see that more easily if I get a tree. Oh, let's get rid of it. Yeah, there's a tree. See how efficient my uh, repair department is? I said, hey, rip that saddle off and just give me the tree. It's right here. There is the little bracket. And as you can see, the fender is going to slide on this bracket like this. Slides on there. Now you'll notice the bracket is unlike an English suspension bar that has a clip that either clips up or clips down. This instead has a certain curvature to the bar. So the idea is if you're going up a hill, you can push back as far as you like with this fender and it won't come off. However, should the horse crash and your foot get stuck in the iron, well, as the horse is getting up, the fender will pass through the same angle that is the curvature of the bar and there's an excellent chance it'll slide off and you'll be free. In the Australian bush, uh, ringers as we call them, you call them cowboys, none of them would ride a saddle that didn't come apart on a major crash because they do a lot of major crashing over there. Well, there we go, that's that. Now also, before I go, there's a nice little uh, Baku bridle here which is the simplest of all bridles. There's your forehead band, there's your pole band. You attach the bit here, and then you at, uh, latch it with the throat latch on this side. A lot of people are using Australian saddles for many reasons. Let's go to another good mate of mine, R.J. Wagner. He rounds up cattle with his, and uh, I fitted him with a saddle at his uh, Hollywood place where he didn't have any cattle, which quite disappointed me, R.J. I thought you'd have a few wild bulls there that we could toss. Dan Dart sells many of his saddles to his famous neighbors. Actor Robert Wagner, owner of several horses, bought a saddle and tested it for the first time. How's that saddle? Oh, it's great. Is it? It's wonderful, yeah. It's got a great feel to it. I've never ridden this kind of a saddle before. This is the first time, and uh, it really is it's beautiful, but the gear that comes from Australia is, is marvelous. How did you learn about Australian stock saddles in the first place? Well, I've always been a, a fan of... Uh, the way the Australians handle their stock, and I've read a lot about the Outback and all that, you know. And uh, I've seen these saddles around. They're using them quite a bit here now in the United States. I'm really crazy about this, and I, I'm really happy to be able to, to use it and, uh, and get some wear out of it. That's a, that's a privilege and a pleasure. Well, thank you, RJ. There were no cattle there after all. Well, let me uh, talk a little bit about roping here. You see, it's a very difficult saddle to rope out in its traditional form. It doesn't have a horn. People say, how do you rope cattle in Australia? Well, we don't rope them, simply because the cattle are too wild, they have too much space to run. I know of no cattle in North Queensland, where I come from, that I'd like to tie to my saddle, thank you. What we do is just run them into the ground, chase them for a couple of miles, jump off your saddle, grab their tail, and toss them over. It's very easy to do, actually. It takes a bit of practice. Sometimes you miss and they have a shot at you. 
or sometimes you chase them for two miles and they chase you for one. We call those cattle two for one. But if you want to horn an Australian saddle, I'll sell you one. No worry about that. And it will sustain the pull of a rope. It'll also have back cinch rings so you can cinch down the back of the saddle. But the beauty of an Australian saddle, it's in its original form, the way it was built, the way it was designed, is you don't have a horn sticking in your belly when you're laying up on the saddle at the gallop through the timber or crashing down ridges or having a real blast out there. You don't want a horn. Get a rope and saddle if you want a horn. So let's talk about fitting. What is the right size Australian saddle for you? Well, this is my personal saddle, a JS Champion by Trevor James, a fabulous close riding saddle, and it's sitting here on a stand, as you see. So let's get a, uh, a little pillow. We'll put it under the front here to imitate the horse, the way it would sit on the horse. This imitates the horse's withers. Now, when I'm sitting in this saddle, you can see I have at least a palm's width between the knee pad and my thigh. The saddle's fitting me perfectly, perfectly. Boy, this saddle does feel good too. <laughs> a blonde and a good feed's about all that'll get me out of this. If I was crushed up against that knee pad as in the saddle that was too small, then I couldn't post, I'd be jammed. It would be very uncomfortable, just as if you brought a pair of shoes that were also too small. Conversely, if the saddle was too big, my thigh would be inches away from the knee pad, so if the horse propped or shied or something like that, then I might as well be in a, any other kind of saddle because I would not have the security of the knee pad. Your body weighs a certain number of pounds, multiply that by speed and you get energy, thousands of pounds of pressure. This way you're close contact, you're not locked in, you still have plenty of room to post. Remember, it's only a small post, it's not a big bang, bang, bang. If you can't post in an Australian saddle, the saddle is either too small or you simply can't post. So, this is where you sit at the walk, just sitting back against the cantle. The faster you go in an Australian saddle, the more forward the upper body becomes and the further back the leg goes. So, you are now posting and that's the post. You'll notice now the leg is in a dressage position almost. At the gallop, you are now way forward with your back arched, your backside out, and your whole body secured with the knee pad, like this. And now your leg is in a full dressage position, so you can have leg contact with the horse. You're galloping along and you come to a hill, you want to charge down, get back. Go back in the seat and stay steady and hammer down. Horses without a rider never fall off hills. They only fall with riders on them. Why? Because the load shifted. A shifting load is a dangerous load on a horse. Think of yourself running up a hill with a heavy knapsack on, or another person on your shoulder. If the person wobbled, you'd fall. Same with the horse. Going up the hill now, on the other side, back, grab a hunk of mane, or lean way forward, but keep steady. That's the key. Now the length of fender is critical also to the ride of an Australian saddle. When your foot is slightly forward and your heel is down, your back is straight, your palm's width is off the thigh, you should have a slight bend in the knee, exactly like that. Now to adjust the fender, it's very easy. You slide the sleeve off the buckle, you make a sausage out of the fender, slide the sleeve up the fender, expose the buckle, and there it is, easy. You could actually do it from off your horse if you liked. Adjust it to the right position. You can also punch a hole between holes on this fender because it's reinforced with webbing. And then just simply slide the sleeve back over the buckle, like so. And there you go. First is walking in the Australian saddle. You see your hands are down, your legs slightly forward, your heels are down, you're back in the back of the cantle, you're relaxed, you're moving here on a loose rein. That's what it's about, just sitting, relax. And that's at the walk, which is what you'll be doing most of the time. Now we'll come down past at the trot. The trot's a whole nother thing. As you can see, you can post the trot 
like that, and it should only be a very small post, just that much. So all you should be doing posting. None of this stuff, no posting like that, post, just lightly. Peel is down. All you can do what a lot of Australians do is simply ignore the post, which is this. That's just going somewhere to another place. Now the canter. You can either sit the canter or you can stand it. First we'll sit the canter. Or you can stand the canter, which is going to be this. And then there's the gallop. Gallop, in Australian saddle you get way forward with your hands up on the horse's neck, really forward riding. In case he should stumble, you can reef him back up, reef his head up, just at the gallop. nothing hard about this, that's the whole idea of it. So on a hill climb you get forward, lean against here and grab a hunk of mane, stabilize yourself so that you leave this hand free to not mess with the horse, as in this. Come. See that? It's so easy and easy for the horse because now your weight is forward and he can push you up the hill rather than drag you. Coming down the hill is this way. Get your legs forward, lean back. And you can take quite steep hills like that. There's another one here we'll take. Back up the hill. <clears throat> Coming forward, just put the force forward. There. That wasn't easy. Anybody got a drink? <laughs> so how do you measure an Australian stock saddle? First you start from the stitch seam in the front, take it back to the inside of the cantle and that'll give you the number of inches that the saddle measures for the rider. Frankly I don't care much about numbers, it's the knee pad and palms width theory that really counts. Uh, but roughly the numbers fall somewhere between an English saddle and a Western saddle. About one inch bigger than a Western saddle and about one inch smaller than an English saddle. This is the maintenance kit. First, there's the leather thane oil, a high penetration light oil that goes in and feeds the leather in the saddle. Second, there's a the beeswax, petroleum oil based. Very good. It also soaks in and leaves a sheen on top of the saddle. This, of course, is for cleaning the saddle. So once you've used the saddle soap with water to clean up the outside of the saddle, briskly towel dry it, let it dry in the sun, and then apply a mixture of this and this in equal parts to the saddle using a common old painter's brush, like that. Do it in the sunlight. Do out the flap and simply paint it on. And don't be afraid of it. Paint it on. Underneath the saddle, on the top of the saddle, all over the saddle, paint it on like that. And then it'll soak in. The underside of most Australian saddles have stuffed panels. There's two panels and they're stuffed. They're stuffed with either doe hair, not really doe as in deer, rather hair off, steamed off, slaughtered cattle. Or pure wool, as in wool off the sheep's back, or acrylic flocking. There's upsides and downsides to them all. The upside of this is that it doesn't crunch down so quickly. The downside is it can get a little hot. The upside of this is it's very cool, this doe hair on the horse's back because it's a natural substance. The downside is it comes down a little faster. Wool is somewhere in between. It will also conform. But actually, if the saddle perfectly conforms to the horse's back, it doesn't matter if it comes down. But if you change horses, then you need to do something. You need to adjust 
the stuffing. It's a very simple procedure. The only tools you need is a ground down screwdriver like this. We'll call that an awl. Or this common garden weeder. You can buy them at the hardware store. You can see this saddle has been ridden quite a lot and the stuffing has come down in the front which is where it normally comes down from aggressive riding. So we are going to all the stuffing forward by using this. Inserting it into the stuffing, you can poke holes in this all day long. It doesn't worry it. And we start at a point about one inch back from the leading edge, and we keep lifting up the stuffing, working back, working back like this. And it's about a 10 minute job. We can probably do this in real time if we had time on the video, but anyhow, we'll just keep going. I've been working on this saddle now for about three minutes, and you can see I've really moved the front of the stuffing forward. If I hold it up like that and show it to you, you can see one side is noticeably higher than the other side. But by moving the stuffing forward, I've now created a little pocket in here. Take your common garden tool here, insert it into a slit you'll find up between the two flaps and push, and push it even further forward. Now that pocket here will have grown. Get some more stuffing, in this case I'm using dough hair, here it is here. Get a bunch of it and just poke it in. Get your handy dandy rod here, weeder, and poke it in all the way through that little pocket there, it's very easy to do. Just kind of make sure that you're going to put the same amount of stuffing in each side. And there it is, the stuffing is in, and now we're going to get the auler again and just kind of even it out. Pull some back now, getting down the lump that you've created from what was a pocket, and kind of flatten it out with your palm. And there's one side is done. You can just sort out the bumps. The main technique with this is not to rip the surge. In other words, take the pressure on your little finger if you're going that way, or on your thumb if you're going that way. And of course, don't poke yourself. And there you can see one side has been completely done, and that has taken me about three minutes in real time. So we just even that out in that one side which you've completed. There it is, nice and straight and it's full again as it was when it was new. Now we'll go to the other side. Just turn the saddle around and start this way. Well, there we are. Almost finished the other side there now. You just sight it up line of sight to see that you've got about the same amount in each side. That's important for balance of the saddle. Now you can also check the back of the saddle. If there's still got some fluff in it, don't bother about the back. Now, when do you do this? When do you do the awling? Well, this is my old saddle here. I haven't awled it for about a year. Uh, the front has come down, and I noticed that uh, last night when I was riding, I was having to put a lot of weight in the front of in my stirrups all the time to get back in the saddle. It had widened out. Now, when I ride, I won't have to do that. It'll be perfectly balanced. Uh, the thing about the horse, as far as the horse goes, is the saddle has to be when it's on the horse, the front should be more or less in line with the back of the cantle. If it's down like that, the saddle has dropped. It needs to be awled to put back in that position. If it stays like that, it can put pressure in a small area up here and cause problems for the horse. Weight runs downhill. If you pick it up and level it off, the weight will now be evenly, be evenly distributed on through the panels and with both of them. Now, if you have a horse where it's putting pressure at the back of the panel and the front of the panel, but is not in between, it's uh, missing the horse or it's very light there, put some more stuffing in to fill the bridge. The Australian saddle is unique for this. You can't adjust a Western saddle because it's hard underneath. You can't adjust an English saddle because it's covered with leather. You can't poke through it with an awl. The Australian saddle offers an enormous opportunity to custom fit the saddle to the horse, no matter what the horse, no matter what the circumstance. But awling is temporary, the saddle's in a constant state of change. Indeed, so are you, and so is your horse. You adjust as you're going along.
Now, if your Australian saddle doesn't have an access slot, which is the case with some of them, it's no trouble to make one. Get an X-Acto knife, something you buy at the hardware store, reach up between the flaps, and you'll be able to feel the pouch in there that's holding all of this stuffing. You'll also see two rows of stitching. Don't cut any stitching, that's a no-no. Get your X-Acto blade and poke it in through the leather. It might take a bit of poking, poke it in, and then cut a steady slit in that pouch. The slit should be about this long, then you'll see the stuffing, and you can go to work with your weeder here, stuff it in, do your rolling, just as we explained. No trouble to make an access slot. We've adjusted the saddle. Let's go and put it on the horse. Okay, let's uh, get a saddle on this tiger here. This is my favorite horse, Joe Lucky. Not a bad steed. Fast, fast horse. First, get the blanket on in place. Get your saddle, throw it up. Lift it up like that, clear the channel, let it fall. This is the saddle I've just all, by the way. You can see it's sitting up nicely now, very nice. Bring down your stirrup leathers. Bring your girth up here. See, you've got a ring on the near side. Cinch it up. Cinch your saddle firmly, too. No point in having a loose saddle. There's just no point in that. Doesn't do your horse any good to have him galloping off with the saddle under him. Just a quick note here about position of saddle on the horse. This saddle is in the correct position. You see the top is about level with the back. You see the sweat flap. This is called a sweat flap because it's meant to get sweaty. You can see how the sh shoulder of the horse pushing against here will push this sweat flap out. That is why you do not want a pad that goes all the way around here. You just want it to there so it'll form this natural pocket to protect the horse from this rigging. This top flap protects you from that rigging. And the girth, when you put it on the horse, put the girth as far forward as you can into that pocket. It should slide back about an inch and then steady itself. Now let's talk about mounting. Very important thing to mount an Australian saddle correctly. I'll just turn the horse and get him on the downside a bit. There you go. Take the rein on the near side in your hand like so. Take the second rein also in the same hand and grab a hunk of mane. It doesn't hurt the horse to pull on this mane. You pull yourself up with this, don't pull on the saddle. Otherwise you could pull the saddle off. Now, move in close to the horse. Check his disposition. Is he calm? Is he ready to receive you? Yes, he is. Get your foot up and put it in the stirrup like so and keep the knee in. Now we're heading for the edge end of that cantle. And our head is the heaviest limb we got, so it's imperative that we get this head over the saddle as quickly as possible. A couple of little jumps, one, two, three, and I'm heading for that, and I'm gonna get myself over the saddle, and before I bang the saddle, put my hand on the other knee pad. Watch this. Then I steady myself down in position, and there I am mounted. Do not mount like this. This is how not to do it. Don't mount like that. Doesn't, doesn't work for the horse. We're going to talk in a little bit of detail about the girthing system on Australian saddles. The first single's coming across the top. That secures the saddle, because should, should all your weight come to here, it's got something to grip on. It literally straps the saddle to the horse. But if a saddle's fitting a horse correctly, and you are mounting correctly, then it is very secure indeed. Let's just uncinch this saddle and dispense with the girth here. Completely drop the girth. There you are, the, sa the saddle has no girth on it. Now, if, I've, if this saddle is fitting this horse very well, it shouldn't move even if I go to mount it without a girth. Let's give it a go. Put in the stirrup, heading over to the back. There you are, mounted with no girth. In fact, you can ride this saddle without a girth. Let's go. That 
There we go. That's great. Actually, riding's all about balance. Well, let's go into the barn now and talk about saddle blankets. Remember, the only thing between your saddle and the horse is a good blanket. There are lots of options. A common Navajo blanket is excellent for the Australian saddle, especially if it's made out of pure wool. There you can double it back if your saddle should be too wide. Now sit your saddle on there and it's narrowed up the grip. That's a common Navajo blanket, excellent. This is a pure wool felt pad for a very close fit on your saddle, suggested only for very short rides. Pure wool felt, it's good. It's good for breaking in your saddle. Here's a standard horsehair pad, what we call a standard pad. It's pure wool on the outside stuffed with horsehair, a good everyday using pad for most purposes. You can ride uh, five, six hours and that pad is uh, fine. And this is a brown version, a solid color version of the same pad. You see you've got room for the sweat flap there, which we talked about earlier. Now here's a, a pocket pad version of the same. It's quite long because it has these nice pockets in the back. They're, they're quite good. These little tie straps at the front, you tie those onto the ring of the breastplate. Now, here's a particular pad for very heavy riders, novice riders, or people who don't use their knees, or for horses who have very tender backs. It has a rubber, it has a closed cell foam insert, which you can see under here. We can just pull that out if you like. You can see how that works. That is an amazing piece of high technology. Lateralizes any percussion. An excellent pad to fit inside the other pad. One other pad, of course, the ultimate of all pads is pure wool, as in wool off the sheep's back. As you can see, for this one we have a slit here so that the sweat flap can go beside the horse. This is mostly a cosmetic deal if people want something that looks around, that looks, comes around the edge of the saddle. Not real necessary in my view, but if you will like that look, it's fine. The top part is what matters. That's the back of the horse. And pure wool, you can't beat it on the back of a horse. All right, this is the saddle that I've just been riding now. And you see it fits perfectly on this thoroughbred, a nice fit. Now we're going to try a saddle that is too narrow. I'd throw this horse over there, but I think he's a bit big. <laughs> there we go. That saddle, you'll see, is too narrow. You see the way it is perched high up? And this part is far higher than that. Too narrow. Does not work. Now, here is a saddle that is too wide. See how it is way down in the front? Way down. There's only, it's right on the withers. The back is kicked up this saddle would slide back. So there's your three fits, too wide, too narrow, and just right. It's important that your saddle fit well. First of all, you've got your horse's back to consider, most important. And then there's the possibility of it sliding back, rolling, and all, none of that's any good either. A saddle fitting perfectly should fit in this saddle pocket right here, and that's where all saddles fit if they're fitting correctly, with the girth and the Australian saddle coming down through there. If it slides back, it's generally too narrow. Also, if it's really too wide, it will also slide back, but mostly saddles too wide will tend to roll. One of the symptoms of a saddle not fitting correctly is dry spots, especially up on the wither area. What a dry spot means is there's more pressure in that area than there is someplace else. Now, I've seen instances where the whole underside of the saddle is dry. That's good. It means it's, the, the pressure is evenly distributed. But if you've got just one dry spot here, it means there's more pressure there than there is back here. That means the saddle's got to be elevated to evenly distribute the weight coming down. Often on Australian saddles, these dry spots will disappear as the panels conform to the horse. But if you've got a dry spot here, it means the saddle should be up a bit more, more awling of the stuffing forward, then it should get an even sweat pattern. If, uh, a, if the saddle is too wide, generally the back of the saddle is kicking up as well. The back comes up, the front goes down, it scoots back, and then you can also get a dry spot. If a dry spot continues, it can develop into a white hair area. If it's very severe, 
it can actually saw the horse. Don't ride the horse till it gets sore. Examine this area and check. Now, you can also use as a temporary measure, measure a pommel pad, and that is making the front of the padding more thick than the rest of it. You can roll back the front of the pad and then it's, uh, then it's fine. A handy tool in the Australian bush, besides a couple of good dogs, is the Australian stock whip. This basically is what we use in, instead of chasing cattle with a rope, we chase them with one of these. You never hit cattle with the whip, of course, but chasing them, you let it go off a couple of inches from outside of their ear and they'll move straight off that. And I'll show you how to use this whip. Let's go and have a demo. The Australian stock whip, a great little piece of equipment, especially in the bush. Australia is probably the last whip culture. You see it's finely, finely braided leather attached to a handle, which is called a stock. That's probably why the whips are called stock whips. It comes from the stock, although they used to drive stock. Never to hit stock, but rather to scare them, and the stock will move off the sound. Now, I'll just give you a quick demonstration on how to crack the whip, how to become proficient at it is a whole other video. Stay tuned on that one. So, there it is. The whip goes out. Start with the whip behind you. One leg forward, and the whip comes over the top like that. This is stage one, over the top. The whip should be stiff coming over. Stage two is drop the wrist and come forward with the hand. And then you establish one of those in the whip, which goes down to the end, and it explodes when it hits this little popper. That's the core kinetic energy. So starting out behind, this crack, by the way, is the basis of all whip cracking, this one crack. Get this crack down, and you can move from here to many other different cracks. Slow at first. See that? Slow at first. A little faster. Now it's getting louder. And the harder you do it, the louder it gets. Over and... Now, that was cut on that way. You can cut it this way. Same deal. Or you can get a whip in each hand. A good idea with whip cracking is to always start working with your left hand immediately. And of course, you can get real tricky and then do right-handed and left-handed. And that's called the whip aerobic exercise. That's another video. We'll get on to that in a minute. You can get amazingly accurate with these whips. Let me see if I can find somebody silly enough to hold something here. I found a model here. Dawn points out that... Uh, she runs a computer in the company, so I better not miss. Now, I don't suggest you try this at home until you've had a little bit of practice. You'll notice uh, that leaf is shaking, and there's no wind here. <laughs> so we'll start at the very end and work in. Down a little bit, Dawn. Good show. One. Two inches, that is. Three inches. Four inches, five inches, six inches. <laughs> well, there we go. And Dawn still has the typing fingers. My computer department is saved. An amazing subject, whips, but we'll go into that in more detail in the next video on how to crack a whip. Today we've dealt with Australian saddles and how to ride them. We did not go into detail about the particular saddles. Here we sell all saddles from Australia, from all the major manufacturers. We're not interested in pushing a particular name. What we want is for you to have the right saddle. The right saddle for us means that the saddle fits the horse, that it fits you, and that it fits your pocketbook. For more on our range, I suggest you buy our catalog, covering all of it, 52 color pages. And send us five bucks. Hey, Cole's got overheads too. See you later. the saddles, huh? Yeah, what a ride. That was a 10. <laughs>
<laughs> you converted, are you? Oh, I'm definitely the man from Snowy River now. <laughs> <laughs>